All right, I'm going to have to do something a little bit silly. I just want to take a selfie with all of you guys because, you know, it's kind of cool. I don't actually get to do this very often. They don't let me out very much as an engineer. So everybody smile. Say Seth. One, two, three, Seth. All right. Yeah, yeah we'll do that afterwards. Um, so um, as uh, Dan and Josh said, I'm Matthew Leonard. I'm from Bloomberg. Um, I'm here today to talk to you about Seth's, or sorry, Bloomberg's open source journey and how that kind of like wraps into Seth. Um, so before we get started, I just wanted to say, uh, kind of echo again what Dan and Josh said. It's so nice to see everybody again. Uh, the last event that Bloomberg was at, like Cephalicon, was in Barcelona, right? So that was four years ago. Um, and it's, you know, it kind of sucked not seeing everybody just having to do it all via Zoom and email. So it is nice to see familiar faces again, new faces again. And yeah, it's just, it, it feels great. Uh, the energy has been super cool. The talks have been really interesting. And it, it's really neat to see the community be able to continue to progress even in, you know, the, the times of COVID. Um, one other thing before I kind of jump into this is that these events don't happen on their own. There's a lot of people uh, behind the scenes who help get this ready, right? The Seth Executive Council, um, the people who volunteer their time to go through the talks, the people who from the Linux Foundation who kind of organize this, even the people who help with the audio visual. So if you guys could all uh, join me in a round of applause for everyone who helped make this event happen. So. Thank you, everyone. Um, did that work? Yes, it did work. OK, so um, some of you are probably asking, who are you, who is Bloomberg, and why are you here? And I'm going to answer all of those questions for you. So as I said and as I got introduced, my name is Matthew Leonard. I'm the head of storage engineering for Bloomberg Engineering. And basically what we do is we maintain Bloomberg Engineering's file block object and data protection services. So all of the storage platforms that power all of the terminal and Bloomberg kind of above us. So that's great that you do that for Bloomberg. Who is Bloomberg? So Bloomberg is a financial and media company. Um, we have 7,000 engineers worldwide. Um, our engineering force represents over 30% of our global workforce. and Really, the talk that I said is talking about the company from its foundings to where it is today, right? So why are we here? Why are we at a Ceph conference as a media and financial company? So, you know, the obvious question is, do you even have data? Yes, we do. Um, so Bloomberg produces and distributes and protects some of the most critical and valuable data in global business today. Uh, if you've ever used the terminal or know what it is we do, our data is our bread and butter, right? We provide insight into financial markets for people to make decisions about how to do things with their money. What that means is we actually maintain and operate our own data centers around the world, and we actually own and operate one of the largest private networks in the world. So you may not think of us as an engineering company just from the fact that we are a financial and media company, but we actually do have a very large engineering force, and we actually do a lot of technology. So a long time ago in a city far, far away from here, where it's a lot warmer, um, Bloomberg was founded in 1981. So if you think about what was happening in 1981, that predates personal computers, it predates the internet, it predates the cloud, it predates me, right? So Mike Bloomberg founded the company before I was even born. Um, and at that time, open source was not a thing, right? The mentality of Bloomberg was this is a closed source place, we're going to build everything in-house, we don't trust anybody, right? That's kind of the mantra of the time. That's not what we want to keep doing, right? So there was a new hope. Almost two decades ago, so around 2000, we decided that we wanted to become more of an open source company, right? So we started on a journey towards moving towards open source first. So this was an initiative led by our CTO's office and uh, the engineering teams. And what the goal was, it was to stop rebuilding everything in-house and look for ways to leverage open source technology and bring it in and solve problems at our scale. Um, the Bloomberg open source program office was actually created to help facilitate this. So we have an office in our CTO that does nothing but help Bloomberg work with open source communities, bring open source technology in, and help us contribute back to those communities. So 
what we do is we sponsor a wide var uh, variety of technologies um, and foundations behind them. We're here at Ceph, um, as Dan and Josh pointed out, we are a platinum sponsor of this event. We also sponsor uh, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Um, we're involved in a lot of ecosystems. Again, if you don't know us, you probably wouldn't know we do these things. Um, we are uh, big in the Kubernetes ecosystem. Uh, we helped develop and lead the KServe project. Uh, despite the shirt, I'm not super into Kubernetes, so I don't exactly know what that is, but it's one of the things that we helped with. Um, Another cool project that I wanted to kind of plug was a thing that was actually grown uh, in-house at Bloomberg. Uh, Memory is a Python memory profiler. Has anyone heard of it? Hopefully somebody. Yeah, the Bloomberg people, yay. <laughs> um, so it's a memory profiler for Python, and it was actually developed in-house, and it helps you actually track down memory leaks, memory utilization uh, allocations in Python. Uh, and it's when one of our most successful contributions back to the community it has over 10,000 stars or thumbs up on GitHub, uh, and it's something that we're pretty proud of. Um, just want to make sure that I touched on everything there. Um, and oh, I forgot this one. This is actually another really great point. So again, looking to contribute back and keep open source communities vibrant, uh, we established a, a fund, the Bloomberg Free and Open Source Software Fund. So this is a fund out of our CTO's office that allows application developers, infrastructure engineers, engineers at Bloomberg to evangelize the technology they want and allow Bloomberg to contribute money to those foundations to, again, try and keep them up and vibrant. So the application developers strike back, right? We're trying to move to open source. We're trying to have this, you know, we're trying to have nice things. Um, Bloomberg application developers at this point are still heavily involved in infrastructure. and. What that means is our application developers who represent, as I said, sev there's 7,000 of them, are still involved in hardware planning, capacity planning, data center management of all of their own stuff. If you can start to imagine, that doesn't scale very well, right? If I have 7,000 people and I ask them, what hardware would you like? I'm going to get 7,000 answers. I'm going to have 7,000 things in my data center. None of them look the same, and they're all going to sit idle, right? So what? The, the problems that this causes is that we have pets and not cattle. And from a business standpoint, because I work at a financial business company, that doesn't make a lot of monetary sense, right? We're wasting power. We're wasting resources. We're wasting floor space. We're wasting our own time installing one thing at a time for every single snowflake of a use case. So this, this is not a good place to be. So what we decided to do is, in 2016, we tried to move more towards a cloud-native infrastructure. So what we're talking about is trying to disaggregate compute from storage and be able to scale and grow them independently and support use cases that used to be running on bare metal and try and take the infrastructure platforms away from the application developers. So what that looks like is we start to kind of coalesce around a couple of different platforms. We're talking Kubernetes, we're talking virtualization, and we're talking S3. Right? So these things will become important later. As Dan said, there will be a test, so please remember. Um, so our compute platforms host tens of thousands of VMs worldwide, and our S3 platform serves billions with a B S3, unique S3 requests per day. Right? So these are very, very large systems. Now, um, what do we gain by moving towards this type of platform? Well, what we get is it allows our application developers to do what they do best, which is develop the applications that actually power the terminal, help with the global financial markets, and all that fun stuff. We can also have infrastructure lead development, right? And, and what that means is if you think about application engineers having to do two jobs, they have to run, own, and maintain hardware and infrastructure and do their actual day job of writing applications, they're not necessarily going to stay current with the features in the platforms or the latest technology that's coming in that will help them kind of solve their problems. When you start to consolidate this into a platform led by infrastructure teams, then what you get is the platform starts to lead application development, right? If we as application or infrastructure engineers bring in new technology, new features, we can make that available in our platform to everybody instantaneously, and the entire company can kind of reap the benefits of that. So 
what that again looks like and some more benefits is if you start to provide platforms, so virtualization, containerization, S3 for data, and you orient yourself around open standards or industry standards, you also get a loose coupling between applications and infrastructure, right? Again, one of the downsides of application engineers doing infrastructure is you end up with infrastructure that's tightly coupled to applications and then nothing can change, right? My application only runs on this weird piece of hardware that sits in this corner of the data center and you can never touch it. It's not good, right? So moving again to these platforms and moving to these kind of standards allows us to decouple applications from infrastructure, allow the applications to innovate and move rapidly, and it also allows the infrastructure engineers to do whatever it is we need to do to keep moving our infrastructure forward. Moving to different hardware platforms, get our, getting better density, you know, moving to different technologies. Um, so you can see that we've moved from pets to cattle now, right? Um, and, you know, this, I get to quote LL Cool J here, right? Like, don't call it a comeback. We've been with Ceph for years, right? We actually, I, I went and dug up because this predates my time at the company. We were using uh, Bobtail and Cuttlefish. We were using some of the open or initial OpenStack uh, releases, right? And as I said, there will be a test later. This is kind of why I'm here, right? Like, I'm talking to you about generic, loosely coupled software engineering kind of fun things, like, that's great. But why are we at Cephalicon? Well, we use OpenStack and we use Ceph to power our S3, right? So that is kind of like why I'm standing here talking to you today. So what that actually looks like in our environment is we run a, a, a hostile multi-tenant, multi-protocol Ceph installation, right? We have to provide block storage for our virtualization platform. We have to provide object storage for the applications that sit on top of that. And what that functionally looks like is that looks like dozens of clusters running around the world in our data centers with thousands and thousands of tenants and hundreds of petabytes under storage, all competing with each other, all thrashing with each other, all trying to get whatever their application needs done. So it's, um, it, it's a pretty interesting environment to be in for us. Um, and we also like to live a little bit dangerously. For those of you who were at uh, Cronall and Jane's talk yesterday on multi-site, we leverage some of the latest releases in the bleeding edge features. We, I, I didn't look at the slides before they put it out there, but I guess they said it to everyone. We are running our own version of uh, our own branch of main, not a GA release right now. We're somewhere, I think, between Reef and Squid, just because it had the feature set that we needed because we needed to provide that value, right? So, you know, we're, we're doing some interesting and fun things. Um, and again, kind of coming back to Cephalicon and why we're here. Ceph is the foundation that we are building our house upon, right? Ceph is a solid, solid foundation that provides multiple different protocols. It's reliable, it's available, it's got a great community, you guys are all here. Um, what we've had to do to turn it into a product and a platform to be consumed by our application engineers is add our own special sauce on top of that. And some of that special sauce looks like our own self-service control plane, right? Again, tying all these things together, there's 7,000 engineers. I don't want to answer the phone every time a new engineer wants S3 or wants a VM or wants something, right? Here, go fish for yourself. Here's a web portal, click some buttons, tell us what you want to do, you get your stuff, go away. Um, that's one of the things we've had to do. Also running at a, 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 a you know, I would say large scale, but not the largest by far. We run into some interesting challenges with that scale, right? So we've also had to create our own telemetry and monitoring platforms to monitor all of this infrastructure because it powers kind of like the majority of what we do now. Um, also, as I mentioned, running a multi-tenant and a very hostile workload, we have to enforce some sort of guarantees to our, our customers, right? When they had their own bare metal machines, they could do whatever they wanted, and if they contended with anybody, it was with themselves. Not anymore, they're sitting on top of giant shared infrastructure and platforms. We have to guarantee some level of quality of service or SLAs. So we actually have a talk later today by Alex and uh, Nathan talking about how we enforce SLA guarantees and quality of service on top of S3. Um, where are we now? All oh, right, help us. What was this? Help us help you to help us again. So kind of trying to tie this all together and wrap this up. Um, with, the, the, with the support of the open source office and the open source team that I talked about, and even talking about some of the special sauce we've developed in-house, 
what we're actually looking to do is try and get more involved with you guys, the community, and actually bring these things that we've developed that sit on top of the Ceph Foundation back to you. So we're actually hoping to open source our telemetry gathering system, which we talked about at Ceph Day New York. We're looking to open source our QoS stack to the community for you guys to kick the tires on it, right? See what you like, see what you don't like, see if it's useful to you, see what your thoughts and comments and ideas on it are. And we're hoping to get both of these things out this quarter. Um, we are also looking at mainline SEP development as well, right? So one of the things that we talked about in the panel yesterday and one of the reasons we use SEP is it's a control your own destiny kind of thing, right? Here's the source code, build it, and here's Ceph. If you have a problem, well, here's the source code, fix it, build it, and use Ceph. So we're actually trying to get more involved with the mainline um, Ceph developer community. You may have started to see us like awkwardly sitting in the corner of a lot of meetings, just kind of listening in, not talking much. We want to get more involved, and we want to get more involved in a, in a couple different ways and a couple different projects. So some of the things that are interesting to us are Crimson and C-Store, given the hardware that we run on and the ever-demanding application engineers need for more performance. Um, and the Rados Gateway is our bread and butter for our object store. So we're very interested in some of the multi-site features and some of the new features in that. So if you see us start popping up in those types of uh, uh, conversations, please come talk to us. We're learning. You know, we're just trying to get a feel for that community. But we want to start to be more engaged uh, with mainline stuff itself. So kind of in closing here, we're just happy to be here, right? Like, we're, we're using Ceph, it works, we're doing some pretty fun stuff with it. Um, you know, we've had some, Ceph and Bloomberg have, you know, been not on speaking terms at times, but I'm sure all of us kind of have that, that similar feeling. But um, we're, we're here, we're looking to engage and find partners in the community, and we're hoping to bring another viewpoint, viewpoint to an a already very vibrant and diverse community. Um, uh, what else do I want to talk about here? Oh, um, yeah, so if you see us kind of like fumbling around, please help us, right? Like I said, we're just getting involved in this. We want to leverage you guys' experience. We want to bring our viewpoints and our voice to this. Um, and we're very committed to making sure that Seth, you know, is a pillar of cloud computing for like the next 15 years and more. Um, so if you guys want to chat more about this, because I'm running out of time here, please feel free to stop by our booth. Um, you know, we're all in and out. We've got some other talks going on today. If you see us, please grab us and chat with us. Um, I think we're friendly, lovely people, but I'm biased. Um, and also, I was coached by my recruiter, wherever she is, to say that we are hiring. So if any of you are looking for gainful employment, um, we would be happy to chat with you. Uh, I think, yeah, done. So thank you very much for your time. <laughs>